is it going thrivers heather choate here i'm grateful excited to be with you guys if you can see and hear me okay as i'm streaming live comment me let me know if you can see and hear me i'm super excited to be with you my name is heather choate with high thrive coaching and today we're talking about is there hope if my spouse says he or she doesn't love me so raise your hand put a comment in the comment saying me if your spouse has said anything like i don't love you I never loved you, I can never love you again, or I love you, but I'm not in love with you. If so, this podcast is definitely going to be for you guys. Before I go into revealing what causes your spouse to say this and how we're going to turn it around fast, I'm going to share with you guys our client win of the week. This one is anonymous. That night after we got back home, I asked her what had changed and she stated that she had fallen in love with who I had become and how I make her feel now. I will still be making the changes I feel are necessary for my personal growth in this life for my children, for her and for myself, but I'm grateful for the lessons learned up to this point and pray that every day begins and ends with us together. So this is a couple that were dealing with feelings of lack of love spouse not willing to work on things with him. And now she said she has fallen in love with who he has become and how he makes her feel now. So what do you guys think shifted for this couple? How do they go from feelings of, I don't love you, I don't wanna be with you, I want a divorce, to I'm in love with who you are now. I love how you make me feel, all right? Here's a bit of a hint, it's our path process. <laughs> And this works to help rekindle those feelings of romance, no matter how much tension there might be in your marriage or how checked out your, sp your spouse might be. Now, I asked you guys, and I'm asking the qu same question now. I'm looking to see some of those comments coming in. Is there hope if your spouse says, I don't love you, or I love you, but I'm not in love with you? Is there hope? Can the situation be turned around? And if so, what advice would you give for people who are hearing that from their spouse? You never know how your advice or your perspective or your story of how things turned around for you might inspire someone else. So let's share the wealth <laughs> of our understanding around this issue. All right. Now in the group, I saw many different answers to this. and I'm going to be watching the live comments as well. So hello, everyone watching. Go ahead and comment me if you've ever heard, I love you, but I'm not in love with you, or I don't love you, anything like that from your spouse. And I will send you a free guide on how to reignite those feelings of romance. We call it our Ignite Your Intimacy Guide. So just comment me if you want the free guide on how to ignite your intimacy. All right. Yeah, I see some comments coming in. Welcome, everyone. She said, I can never get back to that place with you again. There's always hope if you stay positive and a bunch of you saying me that you want that free guide. Awesome. I'll make sure I send it to you guys. And as you know, if you're listening on Spotify or on YouTube, I respond to every single comment that we get. So definitely leave your situation there so that I can help you address specifically what's going on in your marriage. Now, what do you guys think causes a spouse to say, I don't love you anymore, or I've just kind of lost those feelings for you? or maybe even I never actually loved you. Where do you guys think this is really coming from? What are some of the causes that creates a loss of love or a loss of passion, a loss of romance and intimacy? All right, I wanna see in your comments there what you guys think. I'm going to comments here, all right, don't give up, stay the course because that's just how they feel today. Yeah, it might be fleeting, um, Emotions that change and come and go with the roller coaster of it, right? Yeah, fear, broken trust, a lack of openness. Tina says here, the narrative that they have for you. Awesome, Tina. I can tell you've been listening to <laughs> our path process here. And that is often what it is, is that they've created a very negative story about us, right? All right, awesome. So some of the things that Mark and I wanted to share with you that cause this feeling of romance or a lack of love in the relationship. We're going to go specifically into a couple things here. And the first is what we call suppression. And suppression means when we start to push down our feelings 
And we might be pushing down feelings of annoyance, of frustration, of anger, of sadness. We all want positive things for our partners usually right at the beginning, right? Especially at the beginning. And hopefully still now you want positive things for your partner. And so sometimes when those annoying things happen or frustrating or hurtful or painful things or angry things happen, we kind of just push down those feelings. And this is one of the patterns that we see that leads to uh, a deeper effect here is that when we continue to suppress down these negative feelings, then it can lead to suppressing of other feelings, even positive ones. And it can start to create exactly what Tina said here, a negative story or narrative about us or about the marriage. So sometimes it's because we have a habit or tendency of suppressing our emotions, of not expressing how we really feel, and then they become more and more negative and we can't even sometimes even see the positive emotions. I'll share with you why that happens in a little bit. The other reason that we often see feelings of love start to dwindle to the point where your spouse might say, I don't love you anymore, is that love, romance, connection, intimacy, sex hasn't been made a priority in the relationship. And this might have been for months, sometimes even years, right? And so essentially a lack of love comes about from pushing down those negative emotions, right? And not having a focus on all those moments that built up the positive emotions, like passion, like connection, like intimacy, like safety, like vulnerability, right? So we sometimes see couples who tell us that sex wasn't present in their relationship. But when we examine a bit further, we find that, you know, that, oh, sorry, that sex was present in their relationship. So we are having sex, but we realize that it might be missing a few things. Maybe it became more of a chore, all right, it lacked any excitement or passion and romance started to dwindle and die, right? Maybe there were just a lot of walls, a lot of resistance, a lot of no's, unwillingness to explore, hesitation, etc. for whatever reason. It could be past trauma. It could be because they felt like their needs weren't being met. And we go into what we call that intimacy withdrawal cycle. So when we don't feel like our needs are met, then we sometimes don't want to meet our partner's needs and then they feel rejected. So then they don't want to meet our needs. Okay. Just an example that I'll give, uh, because I see this one, it's somewhat stereotypical and I'm not saying this is the end all be all. It's just an example. Okay. (laughs) But you know, let's say that, you know, you, uh, your husband comes home from work and you want to share something with him, but he's a little bit checked out watching a game on TV or on the phone right? Or you could apply this to your wife too, or whatever, right? She's on social media and she's not really listening to you. And then later that night, the spouse wants to initiate sex, but you're not feeling like you want to because they weren't really paying attention to you earlier when you wanted to share something really important. So you decline. Then they feel rejected. And so then the last, the next time that you want to share something, they're even less willing to give you an ear and hear what you're needing and build that kind of emotional connection or meet that need. So that's an example here of how we can get into intimacy withdrawal cycles. And we sometimes use sex or uh, emotional connection as almost a weapon, right? We kind of weaponize these things and we kind of use them against each other to say, hey, I didn't like what you did, so now I'm going to do this to you. And that tends to spiral more and more and more and create a bigger negative story about the spouse, such as, In this case, it might be like, you don't listen to me. You don't meet my needs. I don't feel respected. I don't feel heard here. Um, We don't have sex and that's how I feel connected. And so how can I feel connected to you when we don't have sex, right? Any of those stories can be built up from situations like this. Does this sound familiar? Let me know in the comments if this sounds familiar, all right? In fact, I'm gonna go to some of the comments here. I've heard I may have never loved you. My husband doesn't love me. He left us and won't come back. Okay. Yes, it takes a lot of work. Yeah. (laughs) Yes, it does. All right. So when we get into these intimacy withdrawal cycles, then it can become um, a situation where our spouse or we do not feel those feelings of love and connection and safety in the relationship. It doesn't feel safe to express how we really feel. It doesn't feel safe to be vulnerable. It doesn't feel safe to make requests for getting our needs met. And we can also 
have less of a desire to meet our spouse's needs <laughs> and the things that they are requesting as well. Yeah. And it, yeah, exactly. Sex is a big part of the relationship. It is the most intimate connection that we can have with another human being. And that needs to be met with safety. So if the relationship has gotten to the point where a spouse is saying, I love you, but I'm not in love with you. I never loved you. Um, or I just don't love you anymore. Then it means that things have deteriorated to the point where the relationship is no longer rewarding. And they may be looking elsewhere to have those needs met, whether that's to divorce or maybe even an affair or other people in other ways. Sometimes it could be even family members, not in a sexual way usually, <laughs> hopefully not, but you know, they're getting their emotional needs met by talking to their sister a lot or, you know, their mother or their father. And so these other people become, uh, you know, more important to that person and they aren't going to the relationship to work on things and have a willingness to do so. So at this point, we've let these issues this tension, this lack of being able to share and to feel the feelings that we have, like we suppress these feelings of uh, our emotions and maybe we haven't prioritized the love and the romance and the emotional connection and the sex. And so it's gotten to the point now where your spouse is saying this. If your spouse is saying, just as a bit of a insider peek here, if they're saying, I never loved you, that is not true. It is a story. It's a story that they've built up because people don't marry someone that they never loved. It's just a story that they're using right now. And we create these stories because they either um, prevent us from feeling pain or they justify what we're doing. And usually when I, we're hearing, uh, I never loved you, it's I'm justifying what I'm doing. And I'm saying that because then it justifies my actions, it gives me a bit of an out or an excuse there. So some of the worst responses that you can do in this situation. Here's some big mistakes we don't want to make. Write these down, put them in the chat. I want to make sure that they're going into your subconscious and helping you fire and wire new neurotransmitters, okay? This is how we start to recognize what isn't working and to start to do what will work. So put them in the chat because it's going to help them sink in into your mind. The first thing you can do, so put this in the chat, is to panic. Panic turns crisis into a much bigger problem. It might be a big challenge, but it's only going to make things worse when we panic, right? So imagine someone coming to you with some deep, maybe difficult feelings to share, and the response that you get back from them is panic. If your spouse or you panic, that communicates a lack of safety in sharing emotions. That vulnerability wasn't made to feel safe, and therefore it's going to shut it down. It causes many people who are already suppressing feelings to want to suppress them even further. All right. Negative responses to negative feelings is likely how you as a couple got to this point in the first place. And I want you to give yourself some grace here because most of us do naturally, or we're taught to just negatively respond to negative feelings. Think about it when you're a kid. If you're crying, which, you know, you can hear my toddler, my husband's there taking care of her, crying in the background. And, and if you're crying as a toddler and your parents say, oh, you know, big boys don't cry. Or what's the big deal? Just get over it. Stop crying. Right. Or you're so angry and your parents say you need to control your anger or you get in trouble at school because you had some anger. Right. Usually these negative emotions are met with negative responses which then make us fear negative emotions even more. Sound familiar? Okay. So when we have fear over our emotions, that can cause us to want to suppress them and to respond negatively to negative feelings. So we, what we want to do is help all feelings to become safe. Because the truth is, is that no emotion is actually good or bad. They're just tools that our brain and our body use to give us feedback, to help us know what's in our best good and what's not. All right. Now I used to have a lot of resistance towards anger. I taught, I was taught that you shouldn't feel angry and that you should just be loving and kind and forgiving to everyone and that you should control your anger, not let it control you. Right. And so I would suppress anger and I wouldn't let myself feel angry 
because I was scared of it. I thought it was bad. And that if I felt angry, then I would be a bad person. (laughs) And it really was not until about three years ago that I actually let myself feel anger fully and make it safe. And at first I was terrified because there was something I was angry about from 18 years earlier and I was not ready to face it. And it was really hard to look at that shadow self and to be in a space where I could let myself be angry and not judge it and not go into a negative behavior or try to just suppress it again. And when I finally felt the anger fully, like fully, it was like raging hot, right? That's what anger is, it's like burning fire. It didn't last because fire can only burn so hot for so long unless you continue to refuel it. So I just let it burn until it burned out. And then that feeling, I don't have that anger inside of me anymore. I could, if I chose to keep refueling it with more negative thoughts, more negative narrative, more negative behaviors, could keep it going if I wanted to, but it's no longer rewarding to me to suppress it or to fuel it. So what we want to do is help things to feel safe for both you and your spouse. So panic, this negative response to their negative feelings is going to make things only feel more unsafe, both for you and your spouse. When things don't feel safe, what happens? Is your spouse going to want to engage with you more in the relationship or less? Is it going to help rekindle those feelings of love and connection and commitment? Or is it going to cause them to dwindle and them to want to pull away more, right? Now, the other big mistake that you can make is to have repetitive questions about their feelings. Raise your hand, leave a comment if you have made this mistake. I know I have. (laughs) If your partner is saying, I don't love you, or I want a divorce, or I'm in love with someone else, sometimes we can kind of hound them for reassurance about how they're feeling, or we constantly check in about how they're feeling. And what this does is it forces your partner to keep looking at how they feel. And what we see is likely it's going to result in them telling you that they still don't love you. So the more you ask them, the more they're going to think about it. And then the more they come back to you and be like, I don't love you, or I still don't love you. And the more they say this, then the stronger that feeling gets and the stronger that narrative about you and the marriage becomes. Now let's think about a new relationship, brand new, baby new, beautiful relationship, okay? (laughs) A fresh start. (laughs) In a brand new relationship, when you're just dating and you're just learning about each other, what if you were constantly questioning and checking in whether they loved you or not? or how they felt about you, how they felt about the date. How would that appear to you if the person that you were dating did that, right? It would sound desperate, needy, and insecure. And none of these are particularly attractive, right? And so that is what we want to consider now at this point in the relationship. They're already pulling away. So the more you ask them and try to get their uh, affirmation that you have this connection, that you have this commitment, it's going to backfire. You guys have heard me say it probably every single podcast and almost every single YouTube video we ever do, right? But it's true. The more that we come at them with fear and desperation and neediness, it's not attractive. It will push them further away. At the same time, yeah, I'm seeing in the comments here, yes, I went through panic, repetitive questions. Yes, I push and push, yeah. And so this is a very common mistake. As we're in this, I want to know how you feel. I want to know, do we have connection? I want to know, are you committed to me? Am I going to be there for you? Are you going to be there for me? Am I the only one for you? Are you the only one for me, right? Are we going to have this marriage work or not? Are the kids going to have parents together or not, right? The more we're doing that, where is that really focused on? Like, who is that really focused on? Is it really focused on your spouse and what they're saying and what they're needing right now? Or is it really focused on yourself, right? And that's a normal response is to protect yourself when your spouse is pulling away. When they say, I don't love you, your normal response is to protect yourself. And you feel like the remedy to that is, well, if they're saying, 
they don't love me, then I need to do, make them love me again. I need to know that they love me and I want to feel safe and secure myself, right? So what happens is that that is all focused on self and then they're all focused on themselves. And that is why people do not save their marriage. It's because they're primarily focused on protecting themselves and getting what they want and what they need and trying to have the other person give that to them rather than knowing that they are safe and okay, no matter what happens and that their happiness and their security, their sense of self-worth is not determined by what their spouse says or does. And so it's really shifting out of that instinct to go into fight, flight, or freeze mode, to protect yourself, to try to get their commitment, their connection, to make you feel safe. It's shifting out of that instinct and out of those behaviors that are going to push them away and learning how to find those things inside yourself so that you are no longer dependent on them. We call this like codependency, right? (laughs) And when you find that strength within yourself, then you can come to this situation from a place of compassion and understanding their perspective. What is causing them to say this? What is causing them to feel this? What are they really wanting here? And as you increase that level of empathy, compassion, and understanding, you're changing the patterns, right? We talk about this here in step one of hitting the pause button. You're changing those patterns that are going to cause them to pull away and cause them to believe even more that they don't love you. So you're going to interrupt that pattern, but you're going to start to help them feel and know that you are in a calm centered place, which is attractive. (laughs) And we like being around people that are calm and centered, right? It's attractive. It's different, so it's going to get their attention and they're going to feel heard and respected. If your spouse is saying, I don't love you, very likely they're not feeling very heard, understood, or respected by you right now. So coming back to this whole repetitive questions about their feelings, kind of hounding them and over asking them about all of this is only going to communicate insecurity and insensitivity to them, to how they're feeling and where they're coming from. I've seen this happen so many times where uh, our clients will start when they come to us and they're like, I text my spouse every day. I let her know that I love her. Uh, I ask her how she's doing. I you know, ask her how she feels about me. I want to talk about the relationship. And one of the things that we do right off the bat is take the pressure off the relationship. So they hit that pause button, right? So you take the pressure off. You stop asking them all the time how they feel, if they're in love with you, if they want to work on the marriage, right? Take the pressure off. And that in and of itself is a huge win and does wonders for reducing the tension in the relationship. Is that going to make them fall in love with you overnight? No, that's just one of the very first steps to getting there, okay? So love itself needs to happen naturally, right? And so does the expression of love. If your spouse just says, oh yeah, sure, I love you now. Like overnight from I don't love you, I never loved you, I love you but I'm not in love with you to suddenly I love you, like that's not gonna feel real, it's not genuine. And if they say it, it's probably because of a manipulation, which is not what you actually want. You want your spouse to love you for who you really are and to accept you for who you are, flaws and all. I know I do, right? So be confident in yourself and in the process that allows for those feelings to become nurtured. So right now we're talking about what not to do and kind of stopping some of these damaging things that happen when your spouse says, I love you or I I'm not in love with you or I don't love you. (laughs) And so we want to make sure that we do not fall into the trap of this fear and this desperation, repetitive questions about their feelings. Okay. Now the next one that we have here is all about debate. Okay. And this is where you're kind of telling your spouse that they shouldn't feel the way that they do. (laughs) And if you're telling them, well, you did love me and now you're saying I never loved you. Well, that's not true because this, this, and this, and this, if you're trying to play like judge and jury here (laughs) and give them evidence that 
how they feel isn't real or isn't right or isn't true, then you're going to get responses like, well, there's nothing I can be done here. Uh, they're not listening to me. I can't change my feelings. My feelings are what they are and I can't change them, right? So a better answer to this is I don't want you to change your feelings. The reasons they aren't in love is because they pushed down their feelings like anger or sadness or these issues came in the way of those feelings. The relationship never, um, sorry, not never, <laughs> the relationship has not been rewarding to them recently. So you will eventually need to talk about these feelings. So your goal is not to try and change how they feel. Your goal is to allow or help them to feel what they feel. And this is going to give them the understanding that you respect them and that you are trying to understand them, which is really, really powerful. All right. All right. Awesome. I have some questions coming in, but I'm definitely going to go to those here in a little bit. So what are some of the solutions, especially if you know that your spouse has suppressed their feelings a lot? This one might sound a little strange, and I want to make sure that we put it into context that we always solve problems in order. And you need to make sure it's actually the right solution for you. That's why we do our one-on-one -on -one coaching where we work with you in depth to know what's going on in your relationship and give you the right treatment plan. So if you want that, um, comment marriage analysis and we will get you a marriage analysis session where we'll go deep into what's going on for you. But from a broad perspective here, if your spouse is the one that's shutting down feelings, suppressing feelings, actually arguing more can be a solution. I know it sounds weird because the reason you are in this position is because maybe you didn't argue enough actually and feelings were pushed down. And arguments can bring up those feelings like anger and anger can actually be a positive emotion when anger is a driving emotion that creates change. So again, no emotions are good or bad or scary or anything like that, right? They actually are really positive and anger helps us say, this is not okay with me. This is not in my best good. And so we need to change it. Anger is an empowering emotion. It's up on the ladder from apathy. Apathy, hopelessness, guilt, and shame are at the very bottom of the ladder. When we allow someone that's feeling hopeless or apathetic, if your spouse is apathetic because they haven't been feeling their feelings, then bringing up some of that anger is actually going to move them up the ladder towards more empowerment. Now they're taking some of their power and they're expressing how they're feeling. Okay. I often talk about this kind of like lancing a wound, right? And it's not very pretty, <laughs> but it can be very healing in this kind of situation. So it's like your spouse has a wound, right? Say they've got a big gash on their arm and it's scabbed over, but underneath it's just festering. You can tell that all of these things have just been kind of suppressed and they're just simmering under the surface. And you can tell that it's infected and it looks really, really bad. It's like you have to lance the wound, get all the gunk out so that then the wound can finally heal. Sometimes this can feel like things are getting worse before they're getting better because now you have arguments. But when arguments are done with the right, um, method here, then they can actually be very healing because they can get the things out that need to be out. So then things can heal. All right. And above all across the board, right? Whether your spouse has been suppressing their emotions or we've had all these issues that have made the relationship not so rewarding to them or they don't want to be in it. We want to create a safe space for negative emotions to be shared. Negative emotions need to be made safe. One of the first things that we do with our clients is help communication itself to feel safe. If they're not willing to talk about the marriage, if they're not willing to talk about how they're feeling, if they're not willing to talk about the affair, then communication has not been made to feel safe or rewarding. And there is a way that we start this, even if your spouse won't talk to you about those things right now right? Even if they won't talk about the affair, even if they won't talk about the marriage, even if they won't talk to you about anything other than like surface level things, there are things that you can talk about that will 
that we will help you identify what those are and then create safety around those. And as you create safety around those, it starts to open up doors to create more opportunity to talk about more subjects and make more subjects feel safe so that eventually you can talk about very sensitive subjects like an affair, like broken trust, um, like the unhealthy habits or the destructive behaviors. You can talk about the wounds that have happened in the past and have those be a very healing thing because now communication is made safe. We've reduced the tension between you so that now you can really talk about anything and you feel comfortable to talk about anything. All right. I'm going to go to some of the uh, awesome, you bet, the comments here. So mine has not dealt with his emotion issues and how long do I have to wait? It's been years already. Yeah. So if it's been years and years and years and they will not talk about their emotional issues, then there are definitely things that are creating that pattern for you. And so what we want to do is identify what that pattern is that's causing him to want to suppress these emotions, to not talk about how he's feeling and get things going so that he feels safe to share. There are some people that are more open to sharing emotions than others. Mark himself will say, you know, typically women talk about their emotions more than men. That's a stereotype. I get it. It's not always true, but typically women are more comfortable talking about how they feel than men are because men from a very young age are conditioned to not believe that that's manly, uh, that boys shouldn't be emotional because somehow that's too feminine. <laughs> it's not true, but that is a bit of our cultural brainwashing that happens. Uh, and so it's really like understanding that we can work through those things even still that that's still just a paradigm. It's still just a story and that we can make things safe to open up. All right. What about, I love you, but I'm not in love with you. She says she can't be the wife I need. Okay. So I appreciate that question there. There's kind of two stories going on. Typically what I see and what we see here, you know, we've helped so many thousands of couples now when they're saying, I love you, but I'm not in love with you. Again, we're going to go back to the comment made earlier that this is a story. All right. This is a story and they have a story that they built up about us over the past weeks, months, sometimes even years. They built up the story because A, they either want to prevent themselves from feeling more pain. It's kind of like a security, right? Or they want to, they don't want to feel as much shame for what they're doing. And so it's like an excuse or a justification. Often when I hear uh, our client spouse is saying this, the spouse that's saying this is actually a very, usually a compassionate or kind person generally. And they're trying to let you down easy because they know that this is painful and they don't want to cause you pain, even though they know that they are. And so they say, I love you, but I'm not in love with you. It can also mean I care for you in like a friend sense. I do care about your well being, but these feelings of passion and romance, I don't have them anymore. And that's exactly why we were talking about this today about what causes the feelings of passion, of romance, of love to wither over time or to be completely shut off. And oftentimes that's because of suppression. Again, they're not feeling their emotions. Issues aren't being addressed in a healthy manner. There's no safety around handling negative emotions or negative behaviors or that love, romance, sex hasn't been made a priority. And so then the feelings start to die over time. Just like anything, romance, intimacy, passion, sex, love, these are things that have to be nurtured and prioritized in order to be strong for life and with the different challenges and storms that come, right? And so we help you build a healthy foundation so that no matter what happens, you have that to rely on and you have the habits of nurturing intimacy. We talked about the intimacy withdrawal cycle, right? That those cycles tend to create more and more uh, feelings of apathy. Uh, I don't really care. I don't get what I need met. My needs met here. I don't care to meet my partner's needs to the point where then there's the breakdown of the relationship. But the opposite is true. The more that you create safety in the relationship, the more you allow feelings to be made safe, the more that you try to meet your partner's needs in appropriate ways for where you're at, then that intimacy starts to increase things are felt more safe. Therefore, you can feel more vulnerable. When you feel more vulnerable, you have more intimacy. So that is the pattern there. You make things safe, then they feel like they can be vulnerable. And then that creates intimacy. All right. 
Any other questions about that? I will be checking in on them. Awesome. Beautiful. All right. Now I'm going to go to our marriage myth buster. So this is about marriage is about finding someone to complete you. So right off the bat, I want to say that this statement is how you create a codependent relationship, okay? Relationships where one or both partners find it difficult to function without the other one. That is not where you want to be. When you're so dependent on someone else to complete you, that's showing right off the bat that you have a lack of completeness inside of yourself. No other human being can complete you. What we want to see is two very healthy, mostly functional people that are not perfect, but they're sharing life together. And that only adds and increases the feelings of love and fulfillment and satisfaction in your life. If I have to have my husband fill all my needs, right? Or even some of them, if he's the only one that can make me feel, um, make me feel safe, and he's the only one that can help me when I'm stressed, if he's the only one that can make me feel beautiful and secure in myself, what happens when he's gone, right? What happens when he's like, right now he's traveling a lot as a pilot, so he's not home a lot. <laughs> so if he was the only one that could do that, then I would be left lacking. And none of us are meant to be lacking. We're meant to uh, uplift each other and add more to each other, but not to fill in the missing gaps for each other. So our role is to fill in the missing gaps in ourselves. That's why we often hear like work on yourself. To me, that's the best form of what that is, is to find that everything I really want, everything I really desire is actually already within myself. You cannot give something Sorry, you cannot give someone something that you do not have yourself. So the more that you have feelings of peace and wellness and wholeness and love and confidence and security, then what your partner brings to you only magnifies that. It only adds more to it, but it doesn't fill in those missing gaps. So you do not want to find someone that completes you because you're not broken and you don't need completion. <laughs> you are whole and complete just as you are. And then as we come together, that only magnifies the experience and the beauty of, of a relationship. All right. So let me know in the chat what stood out to you guys the most. Do you understand now how your partner came to the point where they're saying, I don't love you? or I love you, but I'm not in love with you. And how you need to be careful not to do any of those mistakes, like panicking, constantly asking them about their feelings, debating them or telling them they shouldn't feel what they should feel. And how the solutions are to help them to feel their feelings, to make that safe, to create a safe space for negative emotions to be shared. And then from there, you can start to nurture those feelings of uh, connection and intimacy and passion and romance. And that is what we've helped so many clients do. I have witnessed my own self, how, uh, couples have said, you know, there's, uh, I'm thinking specifically, uh, I'll just change her name to Cindy. Uh, and Cindy was saying over and over and over in our sessions, I don't love him. We'll call his name Dave. I don't love Dave. I just don't have those feelings for him. I don't want to be married with him if I don't love him because why would I waste my time and my life being with someone that I don't actually love? I don't have any romance. I don't have any passion. And they got to the point where they went through the pause button. She stopped pulling away more, but she was still saying this. They went through where she would start to talk to him, but she was still saying, I don't love you. We got to the point where they're in the friend stage and she was still saying, I'm glad that we can talk about things. I'm glad that we have these healthy boundaries now around your drinking in this case, right? He was drinking a lot and that was a big barrier for her. She was feeling heard. She was feeling respected. They were able to talk about things. They were able to address some of their root issues that created their negative stories, but she was still holding on to, I just don't love you. I don't have the romance. I don't have the passion. And we told her that's okay. We made it safe for her to feel that way. And he made it safe for her to feel that way. You, you feel the way that you feel. This negative emotion is safe. It's okay. I'm not going to tell you that you should change how you feel. I'm allowing you to feel what you feel. And once he took that pressure off, but whereas before he was like hounding her all the time, right? How do you feel? Why are you going to work on us? Where are we going? Right? I just need to know. He took that pressure off and said, it's okay for you to feel that way. Guess what happened? A few weeks later, she fell back in love with him because 
He was now respecting her, understanding her, creating safety for her to feel the way she felt and giving her room for those feelings to happen naturally without pushing them so that it was a beautiful um, coming together, just like when you're falling in love at the beginning, except now you have this well of wisdom of the things that you've learned from the challenges that you've gone through. So I cannot wait to hear how your marriage turns around and how your spouse goes from a place like that. Like with Cindy saying, I don't love you. I'm not in love with you or I love you, but I'm not in love with you. (laughs) And getting to the place where they are able to open their heart again fully to you, to see you for who you really are and to love and accept you. So thank you guys for joining me today. I hope that this was of service to you. And next week we're going to share with you how to stop divorce fast in a live Q and A where you can submit your questions on how to stop divorce and Mark and I will show you exactly how to do so. Thanks for joining me today and we'll talk again soon. Thanks for listening to The Thriving Marriage, your A to Z blueprint for not just surviving marriage, but thriving. Until next time, my friends, thrive on.